Good evening and welcome. My name is Erin Blankenship and I'm proud to serve as the interim executive director for the Florida Holocaust Museum. I'd like to thank you for joining us for this conversation with Holocaust survivor and artist Samuel Bach and Bernie Pucker of Pucker Gallery in Boston. Before we get started, I wanna thank our board of directors for their leadership and support of our important mission and the staff who are helping behind the scenes, Fawn Walker, David Myers and Amy Baruch, as well as the museum's registrar and exhibitions manager, Victoria King Tabor, who has overseen the beautiful installation of our latest exhibition of Sam's work called Ever Presence, Ever Present, Candles and Chants in the Art of Samuel Bach. I'd like to mention that when our program is done, you will see a QR code come up on your screen. We would be so appreciative if you would scan it as it'll take you to a survey about this evening's program. These surveys help us plan future events and assist us when we apply for grant grants. So your help with that is very much appreciated. After our conversation, we'll also take a few questions from you, our viewers. So if you have one, just write it in the comment section below. If you are a longtime supporter of the Florida Holocaust Museum, you may already be familiar with the art of Samuel Bach and may know a little bit about him. This exhibition, Ever Present, is I believe our sixth major exhibition of his work and the museum is fortunate enough to have 24 works by Samuel Bach in our permanent collection. The Florida Holocaust Museum is unique in that it has always placed a great importance on collecting and exhibiting fine art created in response to the Holocaust, recognizing art's unique ability to bridge the gap between knowing and understanding. And now I'd like to introduce our guests. Bernie Pucker is the director of the Pucker Gallery, which he founded with his wife Sue on Newberry Street in Boston in 1967. Pucker Gallery represents over 50 artists from around the world, working in approximately 10 exhibitions annually, often paired with artist talks, virtual, virtual webinars, and gallery dinners. Bernie is currently a board member at the Japan Society Boston and the Jewish Publication Society. He also serves on the Leadership Council for Facing History and Ourselves, as well as the Artistic Advisory Board for the Terezin Music Foundation. In, in the past, he's also served as president of Solomon Schechter Day School, president of the Newbury Street League, and board member of the Friends of Copley Square and the Unity Project. Bernie received his MA in Modern Jewish History from Brandeis University and his BA in History and English Literature from Columbia College. And now I'd like to introduce Samuel Bach. Sam was born in Vilna, Poland in 1933. And from 1940 to 44, Vilna was under Soviet and then German occupation. His artistic talent was first recognized during an exhibition of his work in the Vilna ghetto when he was only nine years old. While he and his mother survived, his father and four grandparents all perished at the hands of the Nazis. At the end of World War II, he fled with his mother to the Landsberg Displaced Persons Camp, where he enrolled in painting lessons at the Blocherer School in Munich. In 1944, they immigrated to the newly established state of Israel, and he studied at the Bezalel Art School in Jerusalem and completed his mandatory service in the Israeli army. In 1956, he went to Paris to continue his education at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. He received a grant from the American Israeli Cultural Foundation to pursue his artistic studies. And in 1959, he moved to Rome where his first exhibition of abstract paintings was met with considerable success. In 1961, he was invited to exhibit at the Carnegie International in Pittsburgh, followed by solo exhibitions at the, Jeru at the Jerusalem and Tel Aviv museums in 1963. Since then, Sam has had numerous exhibitions in major museums, galleries, and universities throughout Europe, Israel, the United States, including retrospectives at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, and the South African Jewish Museum in Cape Town, and at our own Florida Holocaust Museum. And in 1930, 1993, he settled in Massachusetts and became an American citizen. He's also the subject of numerous articles, books, scholarly works, um, and he even wrote his own uh, memoir, Painted in Words, in 2001. Currently, there are two uh, museums devoted to his work, 
um, with one, I believe, on the way, and Bernie can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we, he has a permanent collection on view at Holocaust Museum Houston and the Vilna State Museum, as well as an up and coming museum at the University of Nebraska Omaha. So we are incredibly lucky to have both of you. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, I'm going to start it off um, by noting that we'll be looking at a few of the works that are currently on view at the museum. We have over 70 works on view in this ever-present exhibition, and we're going to look at just a few of them. So I hope that everyone after seeing this will, will take a minute or take a day to come see the, see the exhibition because it's quite remarkable. And I'm going to, hopefully you can see this, um, I'm going to ask Sam to start us off uh, to talk about the work that you're seeing on your screen above estimate. Would you start off by commenting on this work? Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I see this painting very well. Um, uh, I must say um, there is a certain a slightly humorous note in this painting because there is behind it maybe a hidden kind of um, self-portrait. I, I, I mean, uh, as you say before, you, I'm a survivor. Now, in order to survive, uh, how would you explain that mystery? You needed about three basic things. And of course, every story of survival is a story which is unlike other stories, but there is something that is in common with it. Now, what are the three things? The three things are a certain alertness, a, a, a knowledge of adaptability, of uh, initiative, and um, all the things that are related to human intelligence and the um, um, seizing of opportunities. This is one thing. Another thing is the help of others, the help of others for, the, for, for, for so many survivors was absolutely essential. And this is also quite an extraordinary thing that explains something about human nature. How is it that people who were not endangered by themselves, so many Gentiles, have risked their lives to help save others? And then of course, there is the third thing, chance, luck. On top of all these things, you had to have one of those things that we don't know where it comes from. It's luck. Now, the number three I explained is on the dice, which is above, uh, that this person that tries to understand or explain to himself, how is it possible to explain luck? How very heavy it is to bring it up? But there is a slightly humorous thing in it, because the number three of the three things that I spoke about is indicated by three pairs in the dice itself. Now, pairs somehow in my own career have become one of the, the objects of, of, that, that um, represents for me the fruit of knowledge, the fruit that was at uh, the time of Adam and Eve, the major, major item that has decided whether we remain in paradise or we lose it. And this person that is lifting up this pair, connected to other pairs, which are more real and so on, was not even supposed to be there. There is a big X, a big, kind of symbol of elimination, which was supposed to eliminate also this man who nevertheless is there and tries to lift up something which is impossible to lift up. Or if you wish to explain <laughs> all this matter. So this is what I can say about, about that specific painting. And most probably I will repeat myself because so many of my ideas are very similar in many paintings, but they look at them from very different perspectives in order to give them the sense of three-dimensionality that I am looking for. I would also add just simply that 
above estimate could also be above expectation. So the, the notion of the expectation in relation to the three basic principles of having survived um, is combined with the notion of hope. Um, and somehow the reality of your survival exceeded not only estimates, but also expectations. So to have your perspective on the notion of this um, unusually heavy dice above him, symbolizing clearly chance and the throw of the dice and so forth, but for you to have embedded in it the three pairs, again, which is your language of talking about life itself, that the pair becomes a metaphor for the viewer to understand that it is your personal language to get them to engage with your language is what this evening will be about. So Ron, I think we can look at the next piece and see where that takes us. Well, Bertie, you can continue and then we'll... Well, well I, I love the fact that you chose the square dice itself because the square is a rather uncomfortable shape to place within a rectangle on a canvas. And by using the diagonal of the three, here in this case, three empty spaces, but nonetheless, you create a movement in something that otherwise would appear to be static. So as a work of art, and I think it's always important for us to emphasize to all the viewers that your commentaries, my commentaries are separate from the reality of each one of these being a painting. This is one of, I believe, three uh, Fortunas. This is A, I think B has already been sold. The, the titles sort of come depending on how they were stacked up in your studio. But also the reminiscence in this piece of blind fortune. And you referred to that basically. The third of the elements of survival is chance. Yeah. And so that the fortune itself, the fortune teller herself is blindfolded. Um, meaning that she really doesn't control your destiny either, that That's it is right. chance doubled. And there is also something which in the three, if you look at this square that represents the dice, one of the uh, three is, is a ball, which uh, Lady Fortuna is throwing. And it just happens to come at this very instant to add the three to the, number of points. And again, the illusion of dimensionality. Aaron, one of the most extraordinary aspects of Sam's given talent is his capacity to create texture and color and form that is believable. So if you and I were to look at this piece together, we'd say, that looks like a real lady. She has a blindfold on. There's this square of metal with two empty holes and a ball everything looks real. But the world that Sam is describing is on his canvas a reality because it also reflects an unreality, which is human behavior. And I think that we'll see that over and over again, pointing out that we are never sure of what reality we're in. Yeah, we can go to the next piece. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, this is uh, this is almost funny because these balloons uh, would never <laughs> bring up these dice and let somebody survive and um, and there is a little note. Uh, we don't know what is written on the note. I do not know myself what is written on the note. I must say that um, I'm painting paintings with um, uh, with a wonderful collaborator. And this collaborator is my subconscious. And very often I paint paintings and then only when I finish them, I try to look into them and understand what it is that I was telling myself. This is also that makes my work so very interesting because every painting that I paint is not a kind of an intellectual exercise of creating a, um, a situation where you have a given answer. No, I am just in some way um, uh, alerting uh, every uh, individual's curiosity by 
providing um, him with an image that is supposed to make him or her think. So um, uh, when I painted this, I, uh, I had in mind suddenly a, a small poem. I think it was a poem of Nathan Zak um, that is quite famous of a lady in a, in a, in a cattle car uh, that is giving to somebody a note saying, tell them that I and my son Abel are in this car. Which, which brings us back to very ancient history and to a very sad time. You know, Sam, one of the things, uh, I'm sure it's not a reference that you have to it, but I do to the movie Up, which was yeah. an animation and Pixar movie with Ed Asner. And it was this delightful combination, but balloons lifted the entire house up. Yeah. And the notion of balloons, first of all, represent as the candles do later, both celebration, parades, sure. energy beyond us, almost a kind of fantastical world. And then the container, which has the uh, arm and message coming out of it, totally improbable. Even you couldn't schlep a suitcase like that. No. But the idea of inventing it, and then again, as I said earlier, the fidelity to the materials makes it all seem as if it does exist. The other point I think is important, uh, Aaron, for people to keep in mind is that Sam does not begin with an intention. He names the paintings when they are finished. So in a certain way, they're a surprise to him. And then his title is his response to what he's created, unaware of what it was going to be. So it's this wonderful kind of process. And this piece, as he said, is funny. It has a sense of levity to it. At the same time, notice all of the floating pieces of paper with nothing written on them, as if these messages of so many hundreds and thousands of people has disappeared already. So in the context of memory, how do we remain in touch with messages that have already disappeared? Another question, and on to another painting. And that's an idea that's becoming more and more important now. For sure. Uh, safe taking off. This, if you wish, is a little uh, funny again, because there is a, there is a, a big bird, which is, if you wish, a vehicle that is supposed to fly. And this is how very, very difficult it is in certain circumstances to get away from a frightening and destructive reality. But this man who is sitting there is ready to take off and he is full of hope and he thinks that he will move on. Um, this is a painting that relates also to very many paintings of my totally impossible birds. Now, I, I must say, uh, I must confess something. Uh, I was asked, when do you know that the painting is finished? And it is very difficult to answer that. I said, because it's impossible to finish a painting, a painting you have to finish with it at a certain point. But uh, it brought to my mind, um, I think it was Cezanne or some of the old masters who when asked that, said, I think that the painting is finished when I don't see in it anymore the subject. And this, from the point of view of an artist's work, is exactly right. I mean, when the balance of all the shapes is comfortable, when everything sits in the right place, it is just the opposite of what people think that the artist is doing because people think that he has a certain idea and he is going and he has a certain title and he's going to illustrate it. This is exactly the opposite of it. I have maybe a certain idea, but I don't know where I'm going. But then at a certain point, I feel that I have arrived and I don't see in it anymore my idea. And this gives me the idea that the painting is most probably finished. 
And also there's a deadline to have it photographed. So you'd better not mess with it because we, <laughs> yes. we need it for the catalog. Yeah. More than that, look at the fantastic way the dice is somehow presented here as a dovecote, as a place where the birds can rest. And one is peeking yeah. out. And these are messengers that were used during wartime. Frequently, the train carrier pigeons that yeah. go back and forth carrying messages, especially during the Great War, which was the First World War. And then the notion of the bird itself resonates for me with part of Sam's memoir, Painted in Words, where he and some friends took some of the leftover of one of the walls in the ghetto and created a fabricated airplane or bird as a vehicle to fantasize their ability to escape from what was going on. Even more wonderfully, the circles from the dice also become the steering wheel for the man uh, in the cockpit of this uh, fantasy and airplane. And finally, look at the extraordinary landscape. So many of the pieces that Sam does become immediately disorienting because he places either still life objects or figures of this kind in a very bucolic, beautiful uh, Northern European landscape and said, nature itself is neutral. It's what we as human beings continue to do in it that distorts it and destroys it. Yes, the next one I think is very related to this painting, or maybe there was another one, and and and, and not this. We are coming here to a very different um, yep. range of color, and uh, it has also to deal. It deals with Lady Fortuna, but Lady Fortuna here speaks certainly much more about the number six and what a number six means and what a number six means to so many of us, because we know that we were, when I say us, I'm thinking of survivors, that we were the fortunate ones who were not included in the six. But uh, we still have the sense that of, 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 of uh, an obligation of of the privilege of witnessing. And um, witnessing has no timetable. Uh, so um, the time, the number six, and the Lady Fortuna are all part of this small painting. And it really, again, emphasizing not only the six million, the six is the halfway point on a clock, there are so many levels of meaning and the sixth commandment. We should have a quiz to see who knows what it is, but it's lo tirzach, thou shalt not murder. So it is the most desecrated of, in quotes, the 10 commandments in the context of the experience of the Holocaust. All these things going on at one time, and then look back at it as a composition of circles. The movement, including the neckline of Fortuna herself, that these circles create a visual rhythm for you. And the hands of the clock also continue to point directions up, down, to the right, to the left. So there is a visual energy in the painting itself unrelated to the subject matter, but nonetheless very much related to it as a work of art. Of art. Next, please. Probably one of my favorite paintings, Sam, which you need to share the background on. But for me, there is the combination of the structure uh, of the dice below and then this um, heavy duty, almost concrete object above, again, in the form of dice, ominously uh, elevated by these clouds. And then the story itself uh, in the foreground. Um, the catcher relates at least what I remember from your telling of a Chinese fable that you should retell because you're the one in a way that experienced the luck. Yes, I was, I was, I was once um, uh, uh, told that according to the Chinese fable, the luck or chance is the ability 
of a blind man to catch the bird that is flying behind his back, which means that there is always the possibility if he listens well, if he's attentive, if he hears the sound that the wings produce on, in the air and so on, but he has to do something. If he doesn't do something, the bird will fly by and he will not have his chance. And this, this uh, image here is also an image of an enormous It kind of explains the box that contains all the different uh, numbers from one to six as uh, something which is in itself maybe empty. Uh, and um, I mean, we could go on and on <laughs> speaking. Well, of I, I would, I would, for the, looking at the painting now on the screen, the upper area of the structure itself has the hands up of the child of Warsaw. That's yeah. me seeing it and having seen the other paintings of the the reminder of the crucifixion of children right. of the 1.5 million. Something so of that, yeah. It gets embedded there. And then where the uh, empty circles are, they become cannonballs essentially that fall yeah. on the ground yeah. and they in turn crush the silhouette of another bird. So that the interconnection of the images both of the man, of the boy, of the flying bird, of the de deconstructed bird, all appear together. And there's a sense of uh, closeness because of the yeah. structure itself that you've created in this painting that uh, visually makes it very enticing and almost to the extent you think you can go into the space and you'll be safe. Yeah, but, there's uh, also the, the, the two uh, very um, opposed attitudes of the humans. One is doing something, one is trying to catch, the other one has given up, goes away, leaves all these behind, maybe in a state of total despair. It's an amazing painting. I think it, it's one that I have always enjoyed uh, and I'm so happy that it's being seen uh, in St. Petersburg. Let's see the next piece, please. So we move from dice or chance to the ever presence of candles. And just by way of introduction, I think if each person who's looking thinks about what a candle represents for them, a birthday candle, a celebration, if they go into a church, it's a memorial candle, it's a tribute candle, it's an offering. It gets extinguished, it burns out. It becomes a uh, clear symbol of life itself. And then the wax, that comes from the burning candle, also in many of Sam's paintings become teardrops. And that's just the beginning. The rest of it is up to Sam to talk about. Well, <laughs> I, I, I was fascinated by the meaning of the candle, by the, I would say by the universality of the meaning of the candle that goes beyond the Jewish tradition, because in a certain sense, um, uh, two candles are, uh, they're so, so very often uh, to be seen in paintings of Chagall and so on. They have something to do with a specific moment in the Jewish uh, week. But for me, the, um, the two candles from time to time appear also as uh, reminders of something that was destroyed and was lost. But um, I think that you have summarized very well all the various meanings that a candle has. And here, of course, there are these um, stacks of, 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 of made of bricks that remind um, us of a crematorium. And I must say, it is just about two or three hours ago, I have received, I have received a book published exactly 100 years ago uh, in uh, 19, oh, uh, 1920 or 21 of poems of my great uncle. And oh, in wow. one of these poems, he says to his wife, this was written in, in, in 1920, he says to his wife, then one day you will take me from the chair and you will put me in my bed. And this is where I hope that one day I will die. 
And this uh, poet who, who, who was quite a famous poet in Germany, my great uncle Arno Nadel, he died not in his bed, but in a gas chamber in Auschwitz. And uh, today when I, when I read that, I thought, oh my goodness, today I'm going to be confronted with all these uh, stacks of smoke <laughs> that I have painted. <laughs> and I thought of him and of my very dear friend who gave me this book and um, a, a book that um, brought me close to tears. It's also amazing that this friend has no background in Hebrew or in any of these things. And the illustrations were woodcuts done by Jacob Steinhardt. Who was, was my the teacher Bezal in Jerusalem. Right. Who, who was my was teacher in Bezalel in Jerusalem. And who recognized that you didn't need to be at the school for four years and yes. facilitated your getting out of the Bezalel right. school and going to Paris. So the ability of this friend to, one, remember Arno Nadel, to buy this book and gift it to you, uh, is really a tribute to the power of your work on so many other people. And it generates in them the capacity to even create surprises for you. So, I mean, I, I think it's an absolutely wonderful um, tribute to staying alive long enough for all this to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Next image, please. So Sam mentioned the more traditional presentation in the context of Jewish life of the Shabbat candlesticks. So yeah. you have the, the mother traditionally uh, in the role of blessing the candles and this aura of the one moment in the more traditional Jewish home where the woman is front and center, but the candles also representing a form of illumination, which should not be extinguished by us, but rather should be allowed to burn out on their own. And at the same time, the lovely title of mentioned. So the combination of the candles, their flames, and then the relationship to the book in that the Jews um, for centuries were called people of the book. Absolutely. There's this wonderful insight of Ludwig Lewis, and he said that once Jews began calling themselves the people of the book, it meant that they were no longer reading the book. <laughs> but, that, but that aside, Sam, it, and again, the other thing that your viewers should pay attention to is this is an extremely small painting. There's an intimacy you feel that you could almost pick up the entire image and carry it with you wherever you go. So I'm sorry, Sam, you go ahead. We're giving I, ideas to people who come to the museum. I hope right. the museum has good security. Right. <laughs> but your uh, feelings so about it. You said everything about this painting. Of course, there is the book because our, our history and also the history of these candles that were interrupted, that history is today a matter of books that is speak that are speaking about it. And I think that if you wish the work of the Holocaust Museum, uh, of all the Holocaust Museum is one of the, is, is, is one of reminding, of reminding and of remembering and of keeping the memory alive as much as possible because there are consequences to all kinds of, 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 of historical events and political events that people can tend to forget because they are looking for the comfort of uh, their everyday. But things are happening and they should be uh, learned and they should be understood. And I think, I think books that keep the memory of the world are very important for that. There's also the irony of the fact that the combination of the flame and the paper. Sure. The flame is burning for the candle, but is not destroying the books in this case. So Brother Thomas has this wonderful quote that I frequently use, which is memory is more permanent than matter. And this work represents the combination of the physical memory, the physical book, the candles themselves representing a, an important moment in each week. And at the same time, the importance for each one of us to remain mindful, just as Sam said, of the past. Next image, which is really quite an extraordinary image as well. Well, it, it is very much, uh, it is very much what memory means and what memory does, because memory is, is, is always a recreation. Mem so many people have 
of the very same events, very different memories. Because one of the most human thing is that people create memories that are comfortable for them. Okay. Okay. And um, this man here, who not. is concentrating on the image of the of his memory, is somehow also very heavily, um, uh, I would say, uh, troubled by that memory. He is somehow getting stuck to the place where he is sitting. He, he, uh, he it's, it's a troubling painting in the sense that when I'm thinking of memory, of the, of the various memories that people have and where memories do not agree with each other and so on, and of their enormous weight in decisions of people, I um, I found that this is one of the paintings that helps me much more with asking questions for which there are not even hopeful answers, <laughs> for questions with which one has to learn to live, knowing that there are no absolute answers that exist for them. I think that says it all and more, but I do want people to also pay attention to the painting on the wall, which is an extension of the flame where the candle's wick is extinguished in the candle that has so entrapped him. There is still the representation of the flame, whether it's the burning bush, whether it's the continuation of the flame of the candle. And then at the very back of the painting, the single unlit or extinguished candle again. So yeah. the contradictions between that which is illuminating and that which has already been uh, shut down represents another of the questions. And I guess that's important to emphasize, Aaron, in all these paintings, in spite of what Sam says, or I might suggest, the painting should leave the viewer with the questions, not with our answers. Absolutely. Next image, please. Yes, well, this, this painting here is, is, is somehow inspired by my memory of the, of the yellow star that we were wearing on our coats on whatever we, we, we had to put on ourselves when we went out. It was a matter of giving, of, of announcing our identity. Uh, it also has somehow a certain reminiscence of a cross. There is a cross that um, uh, is, is part of this Jewish sense of the two candles, the two candles that seem to be burning. If you look well, the flames are not real flames. They are somehow fixed by two little nails uh, behind, but there are those, um, those very painful nails uh, which again remind you of the crucifixion. And the crucifixion and the star of, of, of David are here united in it. And in a certain way, I painted it maybe uh, as a, my private tribute to one of the most important paintings of Chagall, which is the crucified Jew. It is the, the white crucifixion that's actually in the Jewish Museum collection yeah. and, or the Art Institute of Chicago, I'm not sure which. In addition to which, just as a side note, the flames, the suggested flames of the candles that are nailed to the background are also the Hebrew letter Yud Yud, yes. which is the abbreviation of God's name Adonai uh, in Hebrew. So there's a perfect, uh, and then there's the, shadow of a third yod in the background that helps make this into a trinity. Um, it is really a remarkable uh, image to the extent that one, you even painted it. Because frequently when you and I are looking at the paintings together, I say, so when did he begin to even conceive of that visual image? Mm -hmm. Finally, the candles themselves are actually made of the brick of the crematoria chimneys. So there's so many visual contradictions in this piece that invite, again, the viewers to engage with the questions that it answers. Was the crucifixion, was the cross itself, was the church complicit in 
preparing the groundwork for what happened during the war. There is an interesting book that I just read by a Jesuit priest who teaches at Boston College called The Nazis of Copley Square. And he essentially deals with the Christian front in the late 30s um, in the United States, both in New York and in Boston, led in great part, or at least not if not led, approved and supported by the official Catholic Church. So that coincidence, if you will, or complicity within this entire experience is in this painting as well. And I think it's important for people to both recognize it, but also to discuss it and to think about it. Next piece, please. Well, Bernie, you speak so beautifully and so insightfully about my paintings that I, I would love to hear what you have to say about this one. And I'm not in <laughs> no. a hurry as much as the man here in the painting. <laughs> Well, this is a piece actually put on the catalog uh, cover of one of the two catalogs of the candles. And the other thing I would mention is that we actually published an entire book of the Nerot. Um, and I should at least explain the title. Nerot, when it is a single word in Hebrew, means candles. It is the plural. But in Sam's approach to it, he divided it into two words, Ner and Ot. Nair meaning candle and ot meaning symbol. So the book itself is about the symbol of the candle as seen by or as presented by the extraordinary talent of uh, Sam Bach. So this is just another example. And in a way, um, it's like foretold of the exhibition we open March the 5th called Figuring Out. So it is an exhibition solely devoted to uh, figures in the context of the same environment, if you will, emotionally, psychologically, and historically, that fills all of Sam's paintings. And they're all figures. What it represents and what this represents, it seems to me, is the, um, no, this is not really a word, de-metaphorization uh, of your vocabulary. Candles, pears, chess, all are metaphors that create a certain distance between you, your experience, and the viewer. The figure does not allow for that distance. And so here the figure begins to show up. And then in the present exhibition explodes yes. um, into almost 130 paintings and drawings. And the figure enmeshed in the context of the candles, of memorial, of memory, of celebration, of loss, is such a powerful image. We're suddenly passing into the stage of your personal exploration. What I also wanted to, in this painting, when I painted it, I wanted to put the verticality of the symbol of the monument of the this broken, and reconstructed uh, candles uh, against somebody who hurries as if he wanted to catch the train and has absolutely no time to think about what this monument says. Um, the, it is something that has to do mm, uh, with the connection of our present life and the past. And the way that very often people in the hurry that they are always in to do everything that they want to do, um, they tend to forget. They simply tend to forget the past. And there is nothing more present in our lives than the past. You know, it also occurred to me when you use the word monument, how many of these paintings in fact suggest three dimensionality. So if this were a sculptor, sculpture, yeah. and by, in a sense, uh, drawing us to that moment with the magic of your ability to create three-dimensionality, it becomes a monument. It becomes this tribute to speed, to missing out on all of life because yeah. we're in such a big rush. 
And then the candles only become a pretext in the midst of all this rushing around, if you will. Next painting, please. Again, something about memory, something about maybe the running out of memory. Uh, as you said before, a candle is somehow also life in itself, because we exist here, uh, we burn very slowly, very slowly, and then somehow it is very difficult to admit, we know that one day the wick will burn out and we won't be there. So there is this kind of melting, a continuous melting and disappearing of the material that is there, but we cherish life, we must cherish life, and we must hold it up as long as it is possible to do the best with it. It's interesting that the candles wax, for me, are these extended teardrops, yeah. and yet they have created this pool of wax that the witness, if she is there for testimony or is gathering testimony, is essentially encompassed by. Yeah. And once again, having placed it in nature, there's this wonderful um, device that you use quite frequently of suspension, these ropes yeah. that are ec above and beyond outside the frame of the image itself. <clears throat> Is this being held by a force beyond us? Is it being manipulated by a force? How does it even exist? Because it certainly doesn't comply with the rules of gravity. No. But emotionally and visually, it conforms exactly to the sense of memory, of loss, and of memory. Again, the memorial of those who have been lost. And there is also the help of the others, because uh, that lady wouldn't be able to hold that whole thing in that position without being helped. Which references your one of your earlier three yeah. of your trinity. Right, which sweetheart. is with, with, without the help of others, then the idea of no matter how alert you are to what's going on and how much luck you have, you still need the contribution of yeah. others to have survived. Next image, please. Yes, how to get away, how to travel, how to leave one reality and go to the other. Um, uh it is also called it iskor which means remember which is also a certain prayer of memory and it has uh, i think that I, I i i made some sketches for this boat made of stone and so on already many years ago i i remember i had when I was in New York in 74 or 75, there was an exhibition in the Jewish Museum. I had there were several paintings and one of them was this boat made of stones. And I think it had the same, it had the same uh, title. We have called. one in our collection. It was the yeah. very first one. Yes, yeah. the very first work of yours in our collection. However, the stone boat is present and can represent the idea that people think they're going somewhere, but the boat itself is not going to be able to move because of the contradiction of the stone no. in the shape of the boat. But here, Sam, um, I don't know the right technical word in art history, schleps with him <laughs> the iconography of the dice, of the Shabbat right. candlesticks. So all of it begins to come together as he carries with him in his little uh, lexicon of images yeah. The dice are part of this, the candles. And then look at the piece of dice in the water where the circles themselves become buoys or life rafts in a way, yeah. as if as a lifesaver. It would, so it is an extension of where his vocabulary is in the context of his own journey. And then the limited palette in this creates an, another sense of unreality. And yet the piece itself seems to be exceedingly real. Next image. Probably one of my favorite images in this entire body of work, Sam. Uh, it is called, it's the Roman numeral six, which again, we've referred to earlier, but the presentation of this and the combination of the shape of the bird behind it, the combination of the notion that 
you frequently refer to time flies. So the visual pun of the bird and the clock and then the candle with enormous dignity, very little wax coming off of it. And then the shroud behind it creates an almost theatrical presentation of something that we're all very proud of. And at the same moment, all of it in nature, the mountain in the background, the green in the foreground, there's a sense of almost celebration because of the light in this piece rather than memorial. But that's just my reading of it and the color in it. I is think so it's, very, it's, it's very right. I was certainly somehow inspired by so many of the Renaissance religious paintings where where shrouds or draperies and so on emphasize the importance of certain things are a background of something which is which is important and here it is um, it is uh, somehow opening up and showing the light of a candle <laughs> so there is uh, as you say there is something theatrical about it it really is very very charming and wonderful that's fine you can go ahead because we need to look at the next two. Yeah, the singly. next two are meant meant almost as a, as a diptych. As a diptych, yes. One is again they are made of two contradictions. One is space in this one, and the next one will be on the contrary is volume. One uh, has only background of a wall, uh, and the first one that you saw before is space. And somewhere embedded in this is, of course, this, the, the, the notion of the yellow star of David, the uh, imposed um, identification of uh, the Jew. It touches, it touches um, a very complex, um, unresolvable question uh, that the existentialists tried years ago to answer when uh, Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre said, you are Jewish, you are a Jew, because the others see you as such. And of course, so many Jews were irritated by this answer, uh, by this definition. And it somehow had to do with these unanswerable questions um, of what we um, decide for ourselves and what in our decisions is the result of circumstances. I have no answer for that, <laughs> but my lack of answers is exactly uh, uh, nourishing these two paintings and all the enigma that is related to the two of them. So just very briefly, first and foremost, the shape in both of them is the shape of one of the Ten Commandments. So you have this rounded top. Yeah. The first one, if we can just go back for a minute um, to point out to people that the flame of the candle here is the positive negative shape of the Hebrew letter Yud, yeah. Yud. Again, it's the abbreviation of God's name. And then this very, um, elegant uh, envelope closer, if you will, becomes the wick of the candle that leads to the flame. So the notion of that, and notice carefully again, that these tablets, this one and in the next one, are bullet hole ridden. So that the fundament of Western civilization, if it is the Ten Commandments, is totally assaulted. And it's assaulted not by external forces, but by human beings. What we have done to what was supposed to be the foundation of civilization, of thoughtfulness, of relationships and so forth. It's on us in a certain sense. So the notion of starlight refers very clearly to the yellow star, but it's also a form of illumination about the misdeeds of mankind. So we have just a couple of more, uh, probably, I shouldn't say it too often, but the next one is among my favorites of in the whole series <laughs> of pieces, because if there's a painting of contradictions, this is it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, I think that I have already said about contradictions, whatever I had to say, and especially in this very painting. So uh, Bernie, I leave, <laughs> I leave to you. 
<laughs> that... Well, I think most first and foremost, the title. Yeah. <clears throat> Where does the title readers come from? And when you begin to look carefully, it is related to the fact that the open grave is the shape of a book. Right. And then what is going on in the context of the book? First of all, the candles are inverted with the flames going downward. Again, an impossibility. And then the ash of the flames themselves is moving upward. So it creates a visual movement, but it certainly doesn't in any way reflect the reality that you and I know. In addition, both of the, in quote, grave diggers, if you will, or observers on the side are bearing their cross. In this case, they're both carrying extinguished candles. And the one that we see closest to us on the right of the painting is already X'd out, as Sam indicated before. What about the improbability of the inverted candles being suspended from a tree that is already cut off? So virtually every aspect of this painting is a visual contradiction. And at the same time, there's a sense of equanimity, of calm, of beauty, of nature, so that we're engaged on a consistent basis with all the contradictions of life itself in this painting called The Readers. And finally, the last piece, and I don't know if you want to invite questions or you've given up by now, Aaron. Oh, this but, is, uh, <laughs> oh no, yeah, we'll invite questions and we already have very a few. Much <laughs> Sorry, Sam, go ahead. No, I said this is a painting which is very much Vilna. It's, it's really dedicated to my native town. It is called Native Town to Vilna. Vilna in the center of the town where there used to be um, the Jewish quarter in the ancient part of Vilna. Um, the two sides of the streets, uh, houses were connected by arches that became a kind of a symbol of the, of the Vilna. So, so the Vilna that I painted here, certainly the Jewish Vilna, which is very much indicated by the two candles that do not exist anymore. And, um, and this is for me, uh, the one of, I think my most emotionally painted paintings, because it has to do with the childhood memories and with uh, 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 the Hebrew letters, the Vav and the G Gimel, the uh, Vilna, the Vav for Vilna and the uh, uh, Gimel for Ghetto uh, are on the left side, leaning there against a wall that, that somehow uh, suggests uh, dice. Which is the perfect piece to bring the entire exhibition together because it is the combination, Aaron, and I'm grateful to you for having suggested that we combine the two, to have the two and to again clarify that Sam's world may have many, many objects in it, whether it's pairs, chests, and so forth, but they all eventually come back together because the same imagination, the same genius is painting each one of these pieces and draws in a very specific sense from that reservoir of images and then brings them together as this painting does with the candles, the negative space of the flames of the candles, the dice in the lower left hand, and this extraordinary image of the um, Jewish ghetto of Vilna, which I visited with Sam on a couple of occasions. And the other reality that these archways are held up by the buildings on both sides of the street. So the notion of both the fragility of that, and yet the history of that space, not far from where the Samuel Bach Museum in Vilnius is today, um, is an invitation to make a international tour to Bach museums. The <laughs> one in Vilna, the one in Florida, the one in Houston, and one day the one that will be at the University of Nebraska in Omaha, which Sam has donated 512 works of art to, with the intention that it will become a international center for the study of human rights and moral choice. Seems like a good place to end if there are questions. Amazing. More than happy to be, try to engage them. And to thank you, Aaron, thank your entire staff for your ongoing commitment to Sam, to his art and to its importance, not only in the mission of the museum, but in our country uh, as well. Well, thank you. Um, we feel incredibly 
lucky. Um, I feel incredibly lucky to have worked with Sam's work and with both of you for the last 20 years. Um, it's really been my honor and my pleasure. And like I said, I feel so lucky to have had that experience. I am going, I have a couple of, my, I have a question of my own, and then we have a couple of other questions from viewers. So I just want to reiterate, if you're watching and you have a question for Sam or for Bernie, please just put them in the comments below. So one of the things I was uh, struck by when you were talking, Sam, I didn't, I had previously um, come up with a couple of questions that I wanted to ask you, the things that come up again and again here at our museum with our docents and with our visitors. But when you were talking and you shared that story about your great uncle after you received that book today, and you said how after you received it, you said, oh, I'm going to, you know, these things are going to come up tonight. So I wonder, as you're creating your work, um, you know, is it painful as you create them because you're bringing up your own memories and, and thinking about your relatives and your own experiences, but also, um, or is it, or, or when you return to them later, do you, uh, does that come out? I must say, I'm painting, I'm now 88 and I'm painting <laughs> for about something like 85 years since I, um, I, I became named artist in my family. Um, painting has always been for me an incredible joy. Until this very day, painting for me is a, is a fabulous privilege. Uh, besides the fact that it's also a therapy. I mean, I could not be happier than when I am with a canvas and with brushes and, and in a studio, in a place where I can paint. I, if I was able physically to paint 25 hours on every 24, I would do it. So people think that if I'm speaking of painful subjects and so on, I'm speaking about what most artists do. I'm speaking about myself, about my experience, about who I am, about what I remember. All these things, as I told you before, are part of the work of my partner, the subconscious. Mm -hmm. But consciously, I'm, I'm incredibly happy. I wake up in the morning and my first thing is, I'm going to paint. I'm going to get up, dress, as quickly as I can make coffee for my wife because mm -hmm. this is a sacred uh, responsibility that I have and then go painting. So none of this painting is related to any particular emotional suffering or whatever. No, not at all, never. It is when I look at the things later and when I try to figure out what it is that I have done there, then I realize how you know, very painful some of these things are or are rooted in a kind of trauma. But <laughs> I mean, who in the world has not been traumatized by something? I mean, uh, tell me of a child that was not traumatized by the death of a cat or a dog. Yeah. So, um, I mean, uh, of course, we cannot put all the traumas in the same basket, but still, I, I, I must say, the getting over difficulties, the being able to do something about it. It's an incredible privilege to do the work that I am doing. And also, maybe this is a certain sense of responsibility that I have. It's not only to make my murdered family happy that you see your, your boy is doing something, but it is also to speak in the name of so many others. Yeah. So, no, no, it, I, I mean, um, I couldn't work, I couldn't work properly because most of my idea is composition, color, light, balance, uh, make it come to life. An impossible, an impossible reality, make it possible. So this is what, 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 what my, my conscience is dealing with. And the subconscious is, is just outloading, uh, Whatever it has. <laughs> I would um, add, Aaron, I would add just simply that your museum, in fact, is an important vehicle for the recognition of the questions and issues that Sam's paintings represent 
that may cause pain to other people. And it's a good pain. It mm -hmm. is in fact, alerting them to their responsibilities yeah. as human beings. I so I think that it's a, a very happy marriage, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. between Sam's joy of creating these and then your responsibility and ours of uh, making it possible uh, for others to be somehow um, engaged in what they can do to make this a better world. So that's a great segue to my next question, which is about context, because, um, you know, as we've heard, I noted it and, and you did as well, Bernie, um, Sam's work is in Holocaust Museum Houston, but it's also in art museums and it's in your art gallery. So when you create your work, are you mindful of the context in which they'll be seen? Because of course, when they're in, in the Florida Holocaust Museum, there's automatically a context. And of course, as you're painting it, you're giving it context because you're a Holocaust survivor. So um, would you comment on that? I am not, um, I am not really conscious, nor do I think uh, about that as an issue. Because I, I, I know that I must let myself do what, what I feel is important. Yeah. I want these paintings to exist. I hope they will survive me. Uh, they will speak something about how I represent a destiny of, of millions. So mm -hmm. this, this is in itself is, 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 is quite important. I mean, art has so many aspects. Art is sometimes a, an expression of, of the, the taste of a generation, what they see as beauty. Art is sometimes something that is purely decorative. Art is something that can be very comforting and so on. Um, um, I don't know if we have much time to, <laughs> to, 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 to deal with it, but I, I, I won't say, I understood something very important years ago when I went to the Museum of Modern Art in Paris and there was art created in 1941 and 42 by several artists. Uh, so there was a still life, a quite difficult, dark still life of Picasso, very beautiful. There was one of Brack that was a billiard table, completely broken up in two parts. And it was certainly a very, a very troubling painting. And next to it was a Matisse, a beautiful woman in a Russian um, blouse, and next to it, a beautiful landscape by Bonnard. And, and all these were pieces, were, were works of art. Some of them dealt with what was happening in their time and seemed to them important, like Picasso with Guernica and so on, mm -hmm. was obviously reacting to what was happening. Sometimes Bragg did too, but in a, in a more kind of, retained uh, way. And some other artists say, we are born, we die, we disappear. Meanwhile, nature is there. Let's celebrate beauty. Let's celebrate nature. Let's not speak of the uh, uncomfortable things. But all these are very valid works of art. So, I mean, there is not, a, there is not one answer to it. You do what you can do best. I think that I am doing what, what I feel that I can do best with this kind of thing. Of course, professionally, I could do so many different things, but I don't see the point in it. I, I, I feel that I can do something in what I am doing, and I know that it speaks. And, and the fact that you have the exhibition of these works is, is very meaningful to me. To us too. Aaron, the interesting other side of it, when you said it's a museum or in a gallery, um, one of the clear um, lessons of Sam's work is that people do not match their drapes to Sam's paintings. <laughs> so context in that case is certainly not part of his agenda. What people do, and it's interesting, the little boy paintings of which we referred to one image and there are many, Sam did over 125 images. When I saw the first group of paintings back in 1997, I looked at them and I said, these are some of the most moving, difficult paintings you've ever painted and we will probably not sell one of them. Mm -hmm. What's fascinating to me is on a percentage basis, we've sold more of those paintings 
than mm -hmm. anything else in any other subject. Wow. And so go explain that because those are incredibly confrontational, difficult paintings. They are. And certainly Sam didn't paint them thinking what context they would go no. into. No, definitely not. So the nice thing is that none of us understand what we're doing and we're still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's an excellent answer. Um, so I have um, a person named uh, Victoria who asked, your color palette is very vibrant throughout your body of work. Do you do specific colors have specific representations within your art? I, I want to attract the viewer to the painting. I want, I want him to look first of all and have the impression of something which is luminous, something which is attractive, and then little by little, see, ah, this is an explanation of a certain way of seeing the world as it is, but not the way that it appears to us superficially, but as it is really, <laughs> unrealistically really. So uh, I, I, I went through periods more monochromatic, more colorful and so on. Uh, I'm trying now to get as much light as I can. Um, and then sometimes I say, oh, my paintings are so light. Uh, let me paint a few dark paintings. So you see, it is also a matter of finding interest in what I am doing and surprising myself, not, not fall into a kind of mannerism that is, some people can say is very repetitive because it is a true, I have painted thousands of works. And in the last uh, uh, 50 years, they are all related very much to given subjects and um, a given vision of, uh, of what I'm doing. Wow. So another person, Renee asked, I, um, or I'm sorry, she wanted to comment. Um, I recall that when I first saw Mr. Box paintings in the museum, our museum, many years ago, they were large. I noticed, and Mr. Pucker commented that a particular painting was very small. I was wondering if you would comment on that. Uh, you know, this is a very important question, big or small? I mean, the very large sizes are um, were in the past very much a need to impress people because uh, artists were participating in huge exhibitions. And if they could impress people with the size of a painting, that was very important. Uh, it's somehow down on me that we live in a different era. Today, the context of people with images is very much a view of the screen that they have in front of their eyes every day. And so much of the art that they see, mainly art that tries to convey a certain thought and so on, is, is the screen. Now, the screen makes a very large painting much smaller and this very small painting larger. So, <laughs> So I think that maybe not consciously, but subconsciously, to me, the idea of the image in itself is, 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 uh, is very important. And I must say, this is a thought that I sometimes have when I enter my studio and I look at all the ready paint uh, canvases. I have very large canvases and I have many small canvases. And I think, well, if I'm going to do this idea on a very large canvas, it will take me maybe the time that I could paint 10 different images much smaller. So I'm torn between, between these um, things. And, um, and I produce from time to time, I take up some large paintings and so on. I still, I have in, in work some large, but it is also true that my age somehow tends to prefer small paintings because <laughs> <laughs> because I don't have enough Tylenol in my uh, in my bottle for my back for a very <laughs> large painting, so I must do them with a certain measure. That's, that's a perfect answer to to indicate to everyone who's watching that there's magic and then there's not magic. Yeah. There's pain and there's not pain. Yeah. So it, it is. It's what life is. It's what all of us live in our own lives that some of it sounds very romantic, some of it not so. Sometimes you have a wonderful meal, but you still have to wash the dishes. So <laughs> there's this kind of combination that is life itself rather than a romantic view 
of waiting till the muse comes. Brother Thomas often said the work only comes out of the work itself. And Sam's joy of going into the studio on a daily basis and seeing the canvases arrayed, some in work, some about to be started, some almost finished, create for him a universe. And it's in that universe that he actually is very much like a young child in a playpen. He is having a ball. <clears throat> so that's very so hard for finish. people to understand because they have to deal with the brokenness, the trauma and so forth that the work suggests. It's all part of one picture. It's not one or the other. And I think that if people do understand that when they come to the work, then it enhances their appreciation of the works of Sam Bach. I have lots of questions, but I think we've run out of time. We so I want to say, I want to thank you both so much for joining us. This was really special. Um, it's special, I think, for our visitors or our viewers rather to, you know, witness the both of you having this conversation and playing off off of each other I know that there's a lot of love and a long time in your relationship so that's very special it's very special for me and um I think you know when people get to get this kind of insider view so now they can go and visit the museum and visit the exhibition and get a, a whole new understanding of the work, even if they've already seen it. So thank you both. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us this evening. I hope that you'll take a minute using the QR code um, on the next slide that you'll see in a minute to uh, do the survey for us. Like we said, it helps us when we plan out our next event, just like this one. And it helps when we um, apply for grants for future exhibitions and future events. So thank you so much again. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Good night. Good night. Nice seeing you, Aaron. A real pleasure. It's such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.